Squat, scorn. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the Antoine Dupont of website builders. Scorn. It's amazing how much more thrilling, enthralling, breathtaking test rugby can be when played with just the right amount of ugliness. This Saturday they saw an epic battle between 2019's two World Cup finalists as England grabbed the Springboks by the throat, choking the champions over a brutal first 70 minutes before a final 10 where both teams were left holding their breath with the entire crowd, two entire nations, as one of the most wonderfully excruciating games ever played unfolded in front of them. Tension and drama bred from every shot, scrum and tackle to tactical masterclasses crashing head on head, knowing one of them was destined for crossed arms and a review for a red card. For after a masterful first few standards, England found themselves banished eventually to that one fate worse than death. A third place playoff against Argentina. While well, the Springboks now prepare for another long week in Paris, knowing only the All Blacks stand between them and a second consecutive rugby world. Cup. So, how did England punch above their perceived weight and cancel out the Springboks in such a phenomenal, unbelievable, career-best fashion? What got South Africa over the line? How deserved was that eventual green and gold win? And can they go all the way on Saturday? Oh my god, the World Cup final is so close. When Steve Borthwick first took over at Leicester Tigers back in 2020, he inherited the team incapable of making the playoffs mid-season and made a conscious decision, therefore, to just spend the rest of that year pissing about. He had eight games to toy selection, conditioning, tactics and ideas in full intensity, full match situations and grind the data gathered into a strategy that could propel them from relegation contenders before to mini-Europe finalists in his first full season in charge and then Premiership Champions of the year after. Using that information from those first few games to better understand his squad and calibrate it all towards a phenomenal semi-final performance against inexplicable bookies' favourites at the time, Ulster. Borthwick's England are a direct mirror image of what he did at Leicester, from in-game tactics to the multi-match sweep of his intentions. And everything we've seen so far over his 11 months in charge was building towards Saturday. Every single training camp with wobbled selection, every misaligned match with chaotic backfiring tactics, every moment where they looked tired was building towards beating defending champions South Africa and knocking them out in the semi-final. And they very almost did it. It begins with the physicality. South Africa have the best pack in the world and the second best on the bench. But if anybody understood the scale of challenge in beating them, it was former bot conditioning coach Alid Walters craftily poached by Borthwick. I previously discussed how England had approached the warm-up games as fitness drills, beasting conditioning in the weeks leading in, leading to players looking tired from minute two onwards and giving rubbish performances. But ultimately, it led to long-term gains as they were in peak physical shit-out condition to combat Argentina and Japan, and then knowing the group was good as well and good as tied up, England came back out for the games against Chile, Samoa, and then a little bit Fiji. Players once again looking prematurely tired and accuracy dropping from its usual standard, all clearly about having their players in world beating shape to take on the box. It's a huge risk, but it pretty much paid off. Very few forward packs hold South Africa quite as England did. George Martin like a brick wall and a Toje in laws immense as Borthwick built a game plan to shut down South Africa. Where France a week ago looked to limit the box by giving them no set-piece ball to play off, kicking in field and avoiding scrums, England decided to use that incredible conditioning to take them on. This is beautiful work as one example. Right before Umbanambi throws in, Ryanak runs over to give the second call, presumably informing the hooker of his role in an upcoming post line out play. Jamie George in the background points out to Tom Curry, as the ball comes in, Martin waits and times his hit. Instead of trying to repel the drive, assuming it's some sort of dummy mall ploy where Umbanambi breaks off, they wrap him up in a three-pronged assault. Cole and Atoji on either flank, wrapping the ball inwards and locking the hooker in. Reinach can rescue the ball and DDA crashes it up as the Bok two-phase move sets in. Inferring Reinach and Umbanambi involved somehow, Curry just man-marks Reinach and when he sees him scoot with Umbanambi wrapping around here, he just dives over the ruck to scrag him. The move is no more. England have been alert, aggressive, stop the mall and then stop the play after. It really feels like there wasn't a single part of the box game ball hadn't looked at and planned for. The Springboks have a reputation as one of the best aerial teams in the game, but so much of that is down to the detail around it. Every team does this now, but the Box run maybe the best escort game in the sport. Whenever opposition set up to kick, Detoy, Etzebeth and other big forwards position themselves between the chaser and the catcher, getting in the winger's way to block them and allowing for a clean catch. So in order to get round this, England played a high-risk strategy. Instead of the usual box kick between the 5 and 50 metre lines, almost every bomb England hung for the entire game off both 9 and 10 aimed for this area between the 5 metre and the touch Line. This allowed May or Daly to run on the outside of them, often literally into touch, over the touchline, out of play. Knowing the kick would be landing near enough to the sideline, they could make just one step back in field and be in position every single time. Here, England start in the usual 15 metre territory, but Mitchell sends it on once again, close to the touchline, and the block blockers end up overshooting. Surprise, allowing Daly to not only get there, but time to turn his back, meaning he can't knock it on and make the catch impossible for Valemsa. Laws is then there to follow up, laser targeted to pounce on the ball once Daly knocks it loose. Indeed, England's first points of the game came from 
in this tactic. Daily once again working from the outside back in to win the contest in the air and after a sequence of offloads, a panic box not expecting to be on the defensive, go off the feet at the following ruck and gift Farrell three points. That five metre channel is a gamble that allowed England to advance downfield time and time again. Daly and May exceptional in the air. Because Borthwick under Leicester's kicking tactics were two-stage. Yet they really wanted to pressure you in the air, they really wanted to contest in the air, but if they didn't come off, everything else was then set up to attack on the next phase, arranging the defence before they kicked, so they could still smash an organising defence well behind the game line off fresh ball. Daly again here dodges the traffic in order to smash for Mullen, allowing a Toje to deploy a smart ploy that saw the male Red Roses, as I shall call them, make an extraordinary eight turnovers over the game, more than half of them on first phase. The Springboks love to clear out with a hit, just taking out threats rather than clamping over and securing the ball, which helps them speed things up enormously, get the opposition players on the floor, and reserve resources. If there's only one guy there, you only need to deal with that one guy rather than locking two or three on to every ruck. And so, instead of the usual threats, Curry and Earl, England looked to use the longer limbs of Atoje, Laws, and Martin as their primary jackal threats, able to stand back and reach in with their big bloody Mr. Tickle arms, such as after this break by Arensa. Umbanambi blasts daily, but instead of getting to the usual jackal position, Laws at full strength just reaches in and pinches it, a snapshot daylight robbery. No big effort, just knowing Umbanambi were going for the first guy rather than clearing over opportunism. And so, after that shot on Vermeulen, the box going backwards and Borthwick technique at his peak, Atoje lingers here, just behind George and Marla, meaning once the box knock those two front rowers off their feet, Atoje is free to reach in unopposed, because the box work fret by fret rather than ruck by ruck, and a third man isn't going to get in position quickly enough. And it's the exact same approach they took to building websites, which is why literally every one of this box squad went to Squarespace. Time was Razzy Erasmus would be the one preaching how Squarespace lets you make a beautiful, beautiful website so simply and so easily. But as his tenure has gone on and he's been in the job longer, players have started taking it on themselves, which is great coaching, to the point of almost obsession. Dwayne Vermeulen actually almost missed out this game because he was tweaking the themes on his fresh new website. He loves it, just with the click of a button, giving him so many options. Manny the box half hour nightmare was mostly because he was focused the entire game on what's he going to do with that new newsletter? What's he going to put in his, his newsletter this weekend? Everyone signed up thanks to Squarespace's wonderful mailing list features, ready to send it to the entire squad. And Sia Khaleesi's early exit in the second half occurred because he told Razzie at halftime he was desperate to see how his fancy new members only area he was looking on his Squarespace website and the coach obliged their captain. And here's the great thing, this is the best bit of it all, right? If you want to be a Springbok, it's probably too late for most of you, but you can be a bit like them by heading to the link in the description and using the offer code SQUIDGERUGBY Weird. Today, to save yourself some money on a beautiful, lovely new Springbok approved website, definitely. Saturday was a physical and tactical masterclass from England, stopping the box by adapting their own game into a nightmare. And yet, England did not win this game. And whilst the box fight back in the second half was immense, and we'll get onto it, I think a lot of that came down to England's inability to craft more of their pressure into chances for points during that first half. And in order to dig into why, I think we need to talk about first the points they did score, namely, this drop goal by. Owen Farrell, a sequence that I think genuinely might be the best and smartest play of the entire World Cup. After a chance for Villy the Root, the box can't quite take, England are given a 22 metre dropout, and check how they set up here, right? Daly is on the far extreme right on the wing, group of big lads here, a second group of forwards here with Scrum Half Care amongst them, Farrell then in the middle, and the front row with George Martin, England's four slowest players, on the far side over here instead. Farrell sends it pinpoint into a blind spot between Aronsa and Willemsa. The fullback isn't getting there in time, so the wing takes it going backwards, he's having to back backtrapping order to get to the ball because it's set on such a specific spot where South Africa can't possibly cover. Meaning Daly can smoke him in the tackle because he's already going backwards. And now check who was in that initial pod from the far extreme just a moment ago, right? It's Tuolangi, it's Curry, and it's Toje. England's fastest forwards, including Tuolangi for the sake of this place acting as a fourth back row forward. Tuolangi and Curry smash over the ruck. There's no chance for South African to get back on side and contest. Toje then securing it. Kerr is already in position, expecting the turnover, with the attack also already set. That second group of forwards having adapted into a pod. Earl tips it onto the outside to get outside the only section of the block defence able to set in time. Fresh on the field, Genge firing through contact on his first touch. The ball is ultra fast, in and out in just over a second, allowing Earl himself to reload and smash it up for another phase, again generating ludicrously fast, quick ball. The box massively on the back foot. England set for a third phase, forwards wrapping around the corner, but they're only the decoy. The ball goes behind to Owen Farrell, who drops a goal from 40 odd metres and nails it. This entire play, from the 22 metre drop, out onwards is pre-arranged. 
pre-called, practiced, set up to be run exactly as so. I speculate after the Argentina game, England might have 50 drop goal drills in the locker, and here's the bloody proof. This is a practice, organized, three-phase move. The fastest forwards are on the far extreme, looking to counter ruck before the ball is even in the air. All set in perfect position. A toji even chasing slightly behind so he can come in and secure it. He can lock over the ball. Care waiting wide in order to play the ball fast. Genji's pod starts setting before Aaron has even caught it, confident that the turnover will come. And in the final phase, Farrell sets on the edge rather than between the posts, sat directly behind behind some forwards who act as blockers but ultimately he looks as though he's only there to bark orders. The defence looking for a physical shot to get them on top after a frantic few phases but instead it goes back and Farrell slots it. This was unbelievable world class tactical play because knowing they're up against the world's finest defence England didn't even seek to score tries off anything other than turnover ball. Their entire attack was about creating three point opportunities whether it's this early attack maniacally pinning every block in until Kiefer and Ben cause one or incredible drop goal drills such as the one we just saw. This England side were built around their limitations and opposition strengths to create something beautiful and yet the chances they wound up being able to take were limited thanks to a few factors. Borthwick ultimately opted for a high risk kicking strategy, one where every kick had to be on the dime and whilst he was very good in the game, very good, Scarf Alex Mitchell, a less renowned box kicker than Kara Young's, not only put one into touch but a few kicks like this just sailed slightly too long allowing Aaron to an easy catch. These might seem small, tiny, you wouldn't even notice a premiership level but 9 of England's 15 points on Saturday came from pressure and kick receipt. Mitchell made 17 kicks during his time on the field and maybe 12 of them were on the money and only one of them was a scrabble as an error but when the margins are this tight and game plan is specific a drifted yard or two in any direction on a kick can cost your team the chance to pull away and get in the lead. I wonder if there's more drop goals to a similar where England were looking to set up an attack off a box kick looking to run a play where they attack it on second or third phase and knock over the drop goal that they weren't able to pull out. Just imagine how different that whole situation would have been if Farrell had sent that kick a yard too deep allowing Willems to take it or a bit to the side it landing on Dutoy. And likewise, they then weren't able to pressure the breakdown and potentially look for those extra three points. They were really tight margins, but they start to matter at this level. Yet, this wasn't the only thing disrupting England. After a shaky first half, we saw an absolute masterclass in sideline management from Jacques Nineba and Razzy Erasmus. The headline was the decision to remove misfiring fly half Manny Leboc after just half an hour. Now, Leboc made a few obvious errors, but for me, the issue in his performance wasn't the kicks or passes or anything themselves, but the decision on when to make them. Last week, we saw the box deploy a new twist on their regular kicking tactic, where the scrum off was still box kick when progress was slow, as normal as it's been doing for five years, when they've lost or need to regain momentum, but when on the front foot, South Africa kicked off 10, meaning the moment in the attack where they had the most momentum, when they're most in control, when the defence was most backpedalling, the 10 kicked it. Usually, cross field wide. It caught France off guard so many times. Young winger Biel Barre repeatedly up flat to make a tackle, only to find the ball in behind him and no idea how to reposition himself. Timing these kicks perfectly resulted in two tries for the box and huge gains in ground and momentum. This week, they looked to run the same tactics, but against defence specially conditioned to halt them. Here, that's clearly the plan, but England marched your toy behind the game line of Leboc, despite the entire chase taking backward steps to be behind him, and no longer on remotely front football to kick off, Leboc hangs it. It means Mitchell is the only one coming onto it for any momentum, Colby's not able to get to his full pace, and Mitchell can take it cleanly. And here, same deal, a line that's a mess of the toy has to ride the tackle, but 10 metres have been lost and the pack is still getting on side. It's bad, bad ball. But instead of being patient and waiting for better ball, Leboc kicks. And the kick is terrible, because he's taken on himself under so much pressure, making the tactic worthless. You're just handing the ball back instead of rubbing your momentum in the opposition's face to garner more and more of it. Stewart takes it and crumples into the 22, England now on the attack. This all changed when Pollard came on, and not because he was kicking better, but because he wasn't kicking. Totally understanding what England were doing, where Leboc tried four times in 30 minutes, Pollard attempted this tactic just once over 50 minutes. England's defence was so aggressive, so disruptive, it was shutting down the chance of piggyback any momentum, so instead he left 90% of the kicking to Ryanek or to Clerk, knowing a box kick is more effective or slower ball as you can set your defence properly, never taking on responsibility himself when he knew they'd just put him under more pressure. The final kick might have earned him the Man of the Match award, but it was this outright refusal to ever take a bad option. He didn't take one over the entire game. They kept the spring box in the match, but the real Razzie masterstroke wasn't replacing his fly half in the first half. It was to come pretty soon after. During the interval, Erasmus and Nineba clearly made the decision they were going to bring on Faf de Klerk, Billy the Roo, and Arheer Snyman for the second half. However, instead of bringing them back out to start the second Sansa, the box wait, and one minute into the half, England are given a penalty and they kick it into an attacking position. However, right as Jamie George prepares to throw in, the referee calls, time off, green nine. 
Substitution. England have been in the exact position for 10 seconds before time is back on, allowing the Springboks to work them out. De Toy sets into position, almost deals it, and Vermeulen shuts off Mitchell's space and causes England to cancel the play. Fast forward another minute or two, and Farrell slides for a beautiful kick that puts Phil Uncert under pressure. He drops and touch, and England have another prime attacking opportunity. Five minutes out, six points up, a turning point in the game to come. Their best attacking chance of the entire match. They're pumped. Farrell's face literally looks like this. Look at him. Look at him. This is a man pumped up. George takes the ball in his hands. England are set. They're ready to throw in, ready for the huge game-defining, career-defining moment. And the referee blows time off. 15 green substitution. For a second time, England's momentum is disrupted. Timing changed. The referee blows time back on. George throws in immediately. It's not straight. South Africa scrum. So Pollard clears the touch. England have a first straight attacking line out. They've got another chance. They're pumping themselves back up. Jamie George has the ball in his hands. This is one he can't possibly get wrong. And you guessed it. Time off Metu. Green. England have to wait for Etzebeff to leave the field on the far side. They jog the entire width of the pitch to throw in. A full 36 seconds of hanging about when they're at their most pumped up and George is trying to remain in the zone. And it gets to Jamie George, who's one of the best line-up throwers in the world, and yet does this. Genuinely the worst line-up throw I've ever seen. And I include, like, attempts by kids pissing about before a game of touch. Seven minutes of broadly bock possession pass, and eventually England get a scrum in the South African half. I'm right, I was about to feed the ball. You know what happens? Once again, time off. Number six green, substitution. Vincent Clark, the box last huge replacement for a clearly exhausted fan of my Herber, was the only second half South African substitution that didn't arrive on the pitch right as England were about to feed a set piece in an attacking position. Not only did the bomb squad bring the impact this week, their mere entrance was time to frustrate and deflate England at moments where it mattered most. Well, half of those moments where it mattered most anyway, because quite a few of those key moments where it mattered most in the second half eventually have only one possible explanation. Kyle Sinclair has been on the salads. I tweeted during the game that England's chances of winning increased 1% of every minute Dank Hole can stay on the field, and sure enough, once he left, England instead entered the Dank Hole. The 53-year-old tight head with the most I collect airfix models face in the world, containing the Springbok scrum to such an impressive degree. If England held out and won this game, I stand by it, I would have given him man of the match even above the world-class performance of Martin Mario and Mr. Laws. Now, I know nothing about scrums, but this shove on the try line for King of Cakes, Ox and Shea is huge, and lays the platform for successive scrum pens to get South Africa into the position for the try for Harjay Snyman them back within a couple of points. This is a lovely move off a mall, only really possible when you've got dual hookers, a situation new to most rugby fans, but not Lawrence Delalio, with both Umbanambi and Fori breaking off at the exact same time. Dual hookers running, leaving Vunapola confused that that isn't exactly hard these days, and getting Dion Fori up to the line. Having put everything into that mall, England's forwards are still retreating back and set around the ruck. They're just trying to get anywhere they can to stop a pick and go, which is on. But Pollard spots Marchant and Farrell are here, filling in and defending a flanker channel through necessity through everyone else being previously involved in the mall and calls Snyman to fill in on Mostert's outside. Faf throws the missed ball and Snyman careers onto the centre's outside, able to bump May and crash over for the score. And then, with mere moments on the clock, but the inevitable running through every fan's head, enemy number one of the South African salad board steps up again, him and Cock doing the job, handing the opportunity to the only man whose blood runs colder than one of Clive Woodward's takes. Andre, God damn Pollard. As someone who's been through the heartbreaking 77 minute penalty from Andre Pollard to put you out in the semi final experience before, England fans, I can tell you, this is tough. <laughs> it's really hard. And it takes about four years to get over and almost always involves a Gareth Lanscombe drop goal to put you out of sight against Australia. It's not easy because the facts of the matter are England were good enough to win this game. England deserved to win this game. And yet, somehow, they didn't. Because ultimately, so did the Springboks. This was a championship moment from a champion team. To beat a side that's peaking without being on fire yourself just underlines what a serious, serious team this set of Springboks are. If the 2011-15 to 15 All Blacks are the greatest team of all time, and I firmly believe they are by just about every possible metric, if they become the second team to ever attain the World Cup next week, this Springbok side deserved to be remembered as the greatest cup rugby team there's ever been. Claiming a World Cup doesn't require dominating to the degree Richie and Co did for four years and between titles, it only requires winning. And whilst there might have been other teams better at other parts of the game than South Africa, and maybe that's shown in the few odd games over the last few years, there's no side out there who has better perfected the art of winning when it matters most. I've got no idea how next week will go, but I've got no doubts. If the Springboks turn up perhaps a bit earlier than they did this week, there's no way it won't be breathtaking, exhilarating, and if the last few performances are anything to go by, a game nobody will ever forget. Thank you for watching that. I told you I'd buy a Springbok shirt in the preview, and I indeed did award it to that game. Um, so some of you may see me around there. Um, that is now 
The semi-finals done. We're not going to have time to get to the other semi-finals, just the quarterfinals. It's really so much more demanding on the time doing it this way with the stills and everything. Thanks, Bill, as ever. Um, we'll do a preview coming up in the next couple of days. Going to do a very brief preview for the bronze final as well. So please keep an eye out for all of that. All of that's coming. Then uh, next week, sh the plan is, just as last time, I put it up on the Sunday after the final, not the day immediately afterwards, you know, eight days later, uh, the video on the final, the big deep dive, same as last time, same as in 2019. That's the plan, using footage as proper, because World Rugby should be easier, should be calmer on it after the, after the tournament's over. So that's the plan. So I'll see you sooner for the previews, but I'll see you next week on Sunday for the big one, the final. If I don't see you at the final itself, I'm, I'm going to walk a final this weekend. It's a big bucket list for me. I'm very, very excited about that. I'll see you all very soon.